Hello and welcome to the 15th episode of the Bunker to Bunker podcast. We are coming off of a rather engaging and eventful week of golf, which is always exciting to hear. Uh, Josh, do you have any thoughts going into this this week? Um, I was thinking about the Ryder Cup that we went to last, or I guess about two years ago, and I was kind of trying to think like what my favorite memory was of that trip, that kind mm-hmm. of colossal up and downs, up and down going into that, you know, tournament to get there and sure. get housed me and then actually be there. So I was wondering what your favorite memory of that was just quickly. Oh, I think it's pretty obvious what it is. What do you think I'm going to say? I don't really know. You don't know? I mean, the favorite memory was obviously the five minutes of Roy throwing me the shoe and John Rahm, get the picture with him and uh, all that. Like yeah. the, that like five minute span. I really don't think you could like relive that. That was incredible. So, yeah. I was think thinking more at, like, of, of like the actual golf. Oh, the actual golf. Uh, like- yeah, the more important things. Um, ooh. That's going to take a minute to think about. Um, I wish we were there live to see Jordan Spieth's uh, crazy up and down from the lake. That would have been cool. But like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Maybe seeing the USA win it on the 16th hole, I guess, would probably be the best part. Yeah. Yeah, we were around that area in that packed mm-hmm. mob area with our trash yeah. bag of goods. But um, <laughs> uh, I think mine's definitely just like the first hole because like we like yeah. volunteered on like, the first hole in like the morning mm-hmm. and like the yeah. second wave. So that I can't really beat that. But yeah, if you want to go off the course, um, like not the actual tournament, definitely that moment with you and seeing all those European guys. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess. Long story short, we stayed after, like way after, because we were like volunteers, and we basically figured out where the Europeans and the United States players were going to leave the property, and all like the Europeans like took pictures and autographs and selfies. Most of them, I, I didn't see Ashley Hovland, so tracking Hovland, we gotta we gotta fix her boy. But um, no, but yeah, like we met a lot of those guys, and um, you got a good video of like Xander's caddy coming out and just spraying champagne. Spraying everywhere. everyone with champagne. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think lastly, now it's on my head. I think just like when like the, I think the sequence of the opening ceremony and then we try to leave and then we go back onto the course and just walk it with no one. Oh there. yeah. That and was walk, yeah. just kind of like, I think that's the moment that you kind of soak it all in. And I was like, how the heck did we mm-hmm. like find our way out in Mm, yeah, almost fuck Wisconsin. Sheboygan, Wisconsin, with, like free housing that you figured out with the guy uh-huh. and everything. So yeah, yeah, I didn't really screw it up any better. Um, I'm excited for you to be there this week, um, or not this week, next week. Uh, so I guess we'll dive into the non Ryder Cup things. Is that we had the Fortinet Championship last weekend. Also, the BMW PGA Championship, we, which we can dive through, but Fort Net mm-hmm. Sahit Tagal gets his first, finally gets his first PGA victory, more notably as a Netflix superstar. Thoughts mm-hmm. on the win and kind of reaction from his family? Well, it's well deserved, of course. And I think that his dad is like the most recognized, I wouldn't say the most, but turning into one of those recognizable like figures in terms of family mm-hmm. members on tour. I, I mean, you got to just admire the guy's passion. I mean, I remember uh, it would have been two years ago at the BMW. I was it was down in uh, Wilmington, Delaware, Wilmington Country Club. And he need, so he needed to go on a crazy run just to make it into the top 30. And I mean, you could hear his dad shouting from, you know, holes away. It's just so cool to see, like, his dad and his family all, like, so, like, actively engaged you know being there all the time traveling with him that it's it's just so cool to see um so a very deserved win for all of them i guess is the the short answer a long time coming and playing very well so yeah very deserved did you see like how many people 
like, like he took a picture with like the trophy and there was maybe like 40 people. <laughs> yeah, he it's it's crazy. Like everyone goes. Like it's absolutely crazy. And he's from I think he's from California, right? Because he went to Pepperdine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For like he is. It, that makes sense. But yeah, no, they were showing pictures of. I was just, I saw a video today. It was like he. It was like a half and half like shot, and it was like I guess the, the tour. Whoever's Instagram account, I'm assuming like the PJ tour. Did they asked all of the people in like his group, like family, friends, like one word to describe Sahif and it was like his dad you know you know friends siblings agents you know whoever and he was getting like choked up so you know it was a good story on the Netflix and I guess it came to a happy ending to get his first win mm-hmm. which uh, was good you know his future's bright you know he's a very pro you know great college golfer I think he's won multiple awards so no surprise there um and the BMW championship we had Ryan Fox um mm-hmm beat the entire Ryder Cup team <laughs> yeah, team that they were trying to uh-huh. and like seven out of 12 or maybe like top 10 or top 15 or 20 I'm not really sure mm-hmm. um so I guess that on their soil they get that win I know that Ludwig was in first after 54 but couldn't hold on but uh, I guess a decent showing from from the European Ryder Cup team any thoughts on on uh, just that tournament alone. Well, it's interesting because you did say, you know, so many people finished uh, in the top. I think it was Rom, Hovland, Rory, Fleetwood. Um, I think there was one more than I'm blanking on. But it's it's really interesting because they definitely sent a message. You know, they definitely showed up. Obviously, it's not as strong of a field if the Americans were, you know, let's hypothetically say all the Americans came over and played in it. But it's very interesting because the Americans didn't really do much competitive playing. I mean, a couple played in uh, the Fortnite, but it's going to be interesting to see if that, you know, translated to positive team chemistry or, you know, kind of got them into competitive shape. So I guess only time will tell what happens with that. Yeah. I mean, I don't really take much of it. The mm-hmm. golf Twitter space can hype up the European team, which because usually we get all the hype going into any tournament or any Ryder Club. It's really just us. But to note, Brooks is playing this week in Chicago. At where? Live Chicago. How how is Zach Johnson? Uh, I'm I'm assuming he'll just fly direct to Rome after Sunday. Yeah, you can't skip it. He has, you know, million dollar obligation to do that. Um, yeah, he can't you know. skip it. Imagine if there was a live golf event in two weeks. <laughs> That's a tough decision. <laughs> yeah, but so I guess our final topic before going into the you know little course preview and some storylines is we have some breaking news from the Phil Mickelson camp. Um, mm-hmm. He announced that he is indeed a, has a gambling addiction. And it's taking a break from gambling, which is kind of a long story short of his message. Um, initial thoughts of that kind of social media. Well, thought. his if anyone hasn't listened to his or read his statement, listen to his statement. Uh, I suggest you do because it's it's a little bit weird in, in my eyes. I mean, obviously, huge huge props to the man for coming out and you know, kind of. Telling people how it is, you know, hey, I gambled too much. I, I didn't have concepts of money because I had so much, which is kind of funny way to say it, but it is the truth. But it's a little bit of a weird time to come out and say it, I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, obviously, I don't want to speculate into what goes on in his personal life, and it really isn't that big of a deal regardless. But, you know, if you run, run down the comment section, a lot of people are saying, Man, he's lost. He's down so bad already in the third week of football that he's just calling it quits for the season. It's it's just kind of a weird time to come out with it. If, I feel like if you wanted to make a statement or be a role model, you do that before football starts, not going in, you know, after two or three weeks of college, two weeks of the NFL or whatnot. So it's a little weird, um, but yeah, I don't I don't have anything else besides it. It just feels a little bit weird. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I guess from uh, just a random person view, it's pretty funny, I guess, but, you know, it's serious. 
obviously, like, he has a lot of money, so, like, I don't even know the amount that he actually pissed away. It's actually funny, I actually bought the Alan Shipnuck book of Phil, like, the auto, uh, or not the auto, oh. the biography, nice. so, actually, that came, that's very funny enough that that came in the mail to Lazio, and then he releases a statement, but, yeah, I mean, it's pretty serious. Um, hmm. Obviously... He's Phil, so he can get the help that he needs and, you know, can suffer against the losses that he made. But I think he's realized that it's more of a problem. Like, it doesn't matter, like, how much money you lose. You can lose five bucks or you can lose a couple million dollars. It's still, addic- you know, addiction. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's yeah. kind of weird that he, like, mentioned, like, fancy football and stuff in it. I thought that was yeah. kind of weird. Yeah, it's a little, guess, little like, bizarre. It, I guess it really came from his his heart, not, like, his <laughs> camp of, camp, you know, camp of people. So, um. I guess it comes at an interesting time of, I guess, football, but I guess it's like right before like the Ryder Cup or something like this week for golf. So maybe he took the right approach in doing this right before the Ryder Cup and not during like the week of however you want to spin it. Uh, so, yeah, I hope Phil gets right. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess maybe this is his case to try to like clean his slate to be like a Ryder Cup captain in 2025 at that page. I feel like that is so far away from happening, but maybe be, in the future. It'll probably be Tiger if, Tiger if Tiger wants it, but that's, a, yeah. that's another conversation for another podcast. Uh, that that would be fun to have Tiger do it. So, but. I got my slate. Um, if you want to go, not hole by hole, but just take like four or five holes from the front or back nine, which I think mm-hmm. I highlighted that I think are – Interesting, unique holes are either holes that I think are going to actually swing the matches mm-hmm. with influence. Um, do you want to do that first, or do you want to go through like kind of the themes that I laid out, and then some of your quick thoughts before actually going into holes? Let's let's go through the themes first. I like I like that more. Okay. Yeah. So I guess I usually do. I watched Golf Digest. There's always a video of like hole by hole. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing up, two of their members, I forget who, um, played Marco Simone, and I think they were there for the Italian Open. Um, so they have seen the course, and what I've heard from them is that they said it's like a very hard walk. So they think that like potentially players might not play five matches. I think that was a similar case to Whistling Straits. It's a pretty hard walk from what I remember. Um, but that's just as a spectator, not a player. I know DJ played all five. I know I don't think anyone else did. Um, so we'll see kind of the strategy with the U.S. and the Europeans, considering that the Europeans are more top-heavy than us. So, And that's something to um, see over the course of the first couple of days. Um, but kind of the things that when I saw of like reading and watching um, and doing my analysis that driving – you have a lot of decisions strategically off the tee. You can either lay up and give yourself a, a longer iron in, or you can try to cut bushes or bunkers or corners or in water to try to get yourself a more advantage. So I think this is really interesting for like the alt shot and see mm-hmm. like what kind of te- you know team want to do. Like when you play four ball, you can really you know one guy can play short, one guy can try to go for it, depending on like what your skill set is. So I think that's really interesting with like the pairings and 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 how they do it. Um, so I think a- being accurate, I think long and straight seems like mm-hmm. it's the play, which is, um, kind of not what I thought the Europeans would kind of pick. They usually pick courses that it's, it, it's very narrow course. The fairways are yeah. very narrow, which is what the Europeans like, but long seems like an advantage, but I guess that's just golf in our mm-hmm. landscape right now. Yeah. So, um, I'll say that the theme of this is safer to lay up short, although you have a longer iron in. It'll be interesting to see what the foursomes do with those pairings and um, very narrow fairways. And the greens are either two tiered or three tiered, so they could be very interesting around the greens playing from that. So that's kind mm-hmm. of my themes of Marco Simone. Uh, I want to give your quick thoughts on um, kind of. Yes, this maybe like the spectator view. Yeah, so 
obviously, you know, no spectators have been on course yet, and obviously things are still under construction, but on the surface, it seems like a really fun, inviting atmosphere to be involved in, uh, spectator-wise. You know, you, you look at, obviously, the first tee is always the massive part, but in, in the couple of videos that I've seen, it's not dominated by grandstands or by hospitality or stuff like that, which which should allow for some really, like, I don't, I don't know if the word's, like, intimate, but, like, some really, like, cool viewing things, you know, from the sides of hills or stuff like that. Because um, it, it, it is a, a hilly enough property. It's not overly hilly by any means, but, you know, a couple of the holes, like, I think, yeah, like, the first hole is the easiest example. Kind of the green is, you know, on a surface, and then the spectator area is on a hill right right behind it. So that, that'll be ridiculously busy um, and a very, like, ruckus atmosphere. But... Yeah, it, it, it on the surface seems um, seems cool because you, you look at where it was in France. Um, that was very dominated by grandstands and, and whatnot. And then obviously the PGA of America can't not pass up the millions of dollars and ridiculous corporate hospitality that they can, uh, they can sell. So on the surface, it seems like a really cool... Um, atmosphere that doesn't involve like massive structures or whatnot so that should be a lot of fun in all honesty yeah i mean i guess before we go into whole thing i said it kind of sucked that when we went to the rider cup that there's no european fans besides those like group of like 12 in mm -hmm. their outfits so mm -hmm. hopefully I'm, I'm assuming a lot of people a lot of you know americans will make the trip so i think you'll probably yeah. get the full kind of rider cup experience in Rome, and then hopefully in 2025 we go to Beth Page. So I guess you'll get the full kind uh, of like the three year window of uh -huh. wire cups and um and get it. I think it's a you know before we jump in, I think it's a bucket list for any golf fan. Uh, so when mm -hmm. we have it in Long Island at Beth Page Black, I would you know regardless of what the price is for a day, just pay it. You won't actually regret it. Um, uh -huh. Save up the money for a one day ticket and go and um you'll have the memories forever so mm -hmm. let's jump into the holes um let's just go every two holes that i have highlighted um mm -hmm. so very interesting course as i said it's very like you know i think strategy will be very interesting to see what they do early on um on friday so the first hole that we highlighted uh is a par for 445 yards um it's Obviously, will will be the most intimidating tee shot with the huge mm -hmm. grandstands and like the Europeans doing their chant, um, like whatever they do, like with this. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know what they say, but um, there's a good video of Rory um, doing that. I think mm -hmm. at in in France. Uh, my screen just went black. Wait one second. All right, we're back. Sorry. All right, all right. I'll I'll restart that because. I lost my train of thought. Um, so, this is not right. Okay, sorry. My computer's acting up. All right. So, hole one, par four, 400, 445 yards. You have bunkers on the left with high fescue. You also have two mm -hmm. bunkers on the right with even more fescue. So, accuracy around the landing point where players will land the ball is very vital so showing like the first hole with all like the pressure and fans and like the europeans uh cheering on there's a big bunker on the on the front left of the, the green and it's a two-tier green so depending on where the pin placement is it'll be interesting to see if this can become a birdie hole for players so i think this is a very mentally obviously challenging hole for the players to start um and a very daunting tee shot with the pressure. So it'll be interesting to see how the players kind of tackle that uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. And then hole two is another par four. It's one of the harder holes. It's ranked fourth hardest on the property. You have a, di uh, a downhill tee shot, which is um, a common theme for this course. Um, there's bunkers on the left, which is like a 280 yard carry. So you can play back to the right, which is more safe, or you can try to carry that bunker um and there's a lot of nasty rough around the green so depending on how they if they make it thick or they cut it back will be interesting to see um the risk reward of hitting the green on hole number two so 
Um, do you want to dive into five? Yeah. So five seems like it could be, you know, one of, one of the like really good um, classic Ryder Cup holes. You know, it's depending on where they move the tees or where they put the pin. It could be drivable. Um, the fifth hole is a what is it? Three hundred and seventy six yard par four. Um, there's a lot of water to the left side. There's an entire lake that runs up the left side. So if the tees are back, you really can't drive it. You'd probably take a short iron or, or hybrid of some sort, uh, knock it down the fair and have a wedge in. But it sounds like uh, maybe from Sunday singles or something, they will probably move the tees up. So that will allow players to, if they want, to try and drive the green. And the green is not overly drivable. I mean, you, you, you look at the whole um there's really not much room on any side there's a bunker that guards it on the front right anything left is dead and anything uh towards the back goes straight into the bunker so it's i actually think it'll probably want to be it'll probably be one of the best holes on the property overall um which is which is really really cool to see um because it's it's a very daunting hole but I can also hop into the eighth hole as well. Um, the eighth hole is uh, more of a downhill-ish um, hole. It is a 503-yard par five. It is the hardest hole on the property. Uh, water guards the entire left side after your tee shot. Your tee shot should be somewhat open. Um, the course is kind of unique where there isn't, an overabundance of rough it seems like there's more of an overabundance of like this i don't know if it's called fescue i've heard it's just called native grass um which is kind of unique you have you don't really see a course where i mean you do but it's it's a little bit uh more unique to rider cup or to this rider cup which is pretty cool but yeah so the prudent play would obviously be uh, uh hitting it down the middle and then a potential layup to the right there's like no room at all to miss the screen short you can miss it short right and if you if you go deep um you're going to get caught in this native grass so easy to see why this is the hardest hole um it doesn't seem like that overly birdieable um to be brutally honest it seems more like a par could could win this i don't think we'll see an eagle at all but yeah it's uh shaping up to be another like great like match play risk reward hole um i'll let you go into the next one yeah hole nine so if you so you get back to back par fives um which the whole eight was it's usually a par four at the italian open but it's a par five so back to back par fives that hole nine it's 587 yards one of the easier holes on the course but you have a kind of a a lake or a stream however you, you want to call it that comes into play um, on the left side of the fairway, and then like the right side is bunkers that are around like 280 yards, so that could also come into play too. Um, it's a very skinny fairway; it's about 40 yards um, apart, uh, and so again, and like all shot or four or four ball is like how do you kind of attack this hole with a par five? Um, and to note that you cannot go long on your approach; you're dead. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they strategically play this hole throughout the week. And I'll jump into hole 13, which I think is probably will be like the most highlighted hole um, throughout the week. It's personally my favorite hole. Um, but I think for kind of obvious reasons, it's, it's a short par three and there's like a farmhouse in like the distance. And I was like watching this video and I also saw Kyle Porter tweet this out and he was like, if I didn't make any bet that's not like a bet on the sports book, it's that speed that's going to go into that farmhouse, yep. which I think is mm -hmm. really hard and impressive to do because it's like kind of in like the distance. It's not really like it doesn't really come into play. So it's, it's a two tier green. So I think I like the short par threes. Um, probably won't have to make birdie on this hole uh, to win it. So I think this is kind of the most Italian hole that we have on property. Um, so jump into the next batch of holes. That's something we're not used to saying. This is the most Italian golf hole on the property, <laughs> um, which is, I mean, welcome to Italian golf, their first ever uh, Ryder Cup. So it, 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 it on the surface looks pretty cool with the with the Italian countryside in, in the background. But yeah, hopping into the 14th hole, another elevated tee box, which 
seems to be somewhat of the theme um consistently it seems like these two boxes are slightly elevated um looks like there's gonna be i, I don't know if you, it, it could be out of bounds down the right but it looks like just absolute crap if you miss the fairway to the right um some trees come into play but there's a plethora of bushes and long grass that could definitely cause problems so i don't think many players will miss right it's a dog leg left so your long hitters will take on a set of two bunkers on the left side um, which will leave them a, a, a moderate iron in approach. Um, there are bunkers guarding the left and the right side with a green that has a little bit of a false front towards the middle. Um, seems like there might be a runoff area at the front that could cause some issues if the pin is up at the front, but I would presume they might throw the pin in the back here, uh, kind of have players have you know very long pitch shots uh, if they manage to miss the screen short, which... Should be interesting to see how they play it. Um, it does rank as the second hardest hole. Um, so yeah, go, let's go from the, the second hardest to the 17th hardest, which would be the... Um, oh, sorry. Was that right? Yeah. Um, what hole am I on again? Hole 15. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was getting ahead of myself. The 15th hole is the second hardest. Sorry. Um, so the 15th hole, again, going back to back with the elevated tee boxes. A um, little bit of a slew of three bunkers down the right side, but that shouldn't really cause many issues um, unless your longer hitters flare it out there. It should be more of just a hit to the left. Um, those bunkers are also protected by the native grass and some trees, so that's really not something players would take on that frequently. But uh, you never know. So going up to the green, um, looks like there's a big area to miss to the left that you could leave yourself a nice, comfortable pitch. Um, the green is kind of in a bowl shape, in all honesty. It doesn't seem overly difficult. Um, it kind of seems like it will constantly feed towards the pin. Uh, a couple trees in the back of the green uh, in case you go along, but that really shouldn't be much of an issue. But it does seem like... Um, if you can hit your spots well on this hole, it, it, you can navigate it uh, easily, but the slightest miscue off the tee or with the second shot will make this hole difficult. Yeah, I'll do the last couple of holes. Hole 16, which I guess is one of the holes that matches could be ended at. Uh, it's a par four, 352 yards. One, It's the second easiest hole on property. Another elevated tee box. You have water that comes into play on the right side, so if you lay up, it's like a 200-yard tee shot, which is the smarter play, or you can try to carry the bunker and water on the right, and it's 300 yards. So I think it's a very interesting strategy, as I said before, with hole 16. You know, matches could be, you know, two up, one up, or even, and it's what do you do off the tee? Do you try to carry it or, or not? So I think this is an interesting hole um, that could be challenging depending on how you play it. And then the 18th hole, par five, around 630 yards, another elevated tee shot. Uh, it's a very easy tee shot, but when you put in the pressure, it can't be. So it's it's more of a second shot hole. Uh, there's a lake or water on like, the left-hand side with a bunker on the right. So it would be interesting to see, do you take on the water to hit the green in two, or do you lay up and just play for a birdie? So interesting finishing couple holes that we have and i think when i was like kind of doing my research i was kind of like what kind of stretch of holes are really like the swing of it obviously like the back nine are going to be like the swing of holes because matches really can't be ended that early so i think that you have 13 and 14 which are like the two hardest holes or no 13 like 12 13 are like the easier holes on the property that you have to make a birdie on 14 15 are the two hardest holes so i think that stretch of like the early back nine holes will really flip and influence the matches um throughout the week so that's our course preview um and i thought it would be fun obviously the Ryder cup has full of storylines that we could go on for days about, but I asked Ethan to kind of rank his top five storylines and we'll go through um, kind of if we had very similar or different ones. I, mean, I, I 
I guarantee that two of them are probably the same, but I think the other three will be kind of be fun and, and how we spin it. So um, should we start with kind of the obvious one and two? Do you want to give what your first one was? So that means if you say two are similar that you looked at mine when you weren't supposed to. So that's not fun. Um, uh, no, I, I mean, it would be shocking if you're one and another, not, not like def, not the rank of one and two. I mean like two on your five. Okay. I, I understand. They're, they're fairly, they're fairly, you know, obvious. Yeah. I, I think the easiest I, way. To, I haven't looked yours. I think the easiest way to do it would be each of us rattles off our five. Um, and then we can we can discuss from there. I think you should give one, and I'll say oh, if I have it or not. And then because like if you just go in order, then we're not really. All right. Okay. So the 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 top storyline that I they do have, which seemingly is obvious, is will the USA finally stop the trend of getting like manhandled on European soil? This is six yeah. straight consecutive losses for them, um, dating back to 1993 was their last win. The, there was one. Uh, I think it was. Uh, 2002, maybe. I don't remember the exact year, but where they only lost by one full point. But outside of that, it's been absolute domination on the Europeans. So easily the top storyline is will they finally stop that skid, which doesn't really seem like it should be happening. But it, it really is. It seems like whatever the home team is just kind of dominates. So will this be the first year that we kind of see a little bit of a, a different outcome? Um, yeah. Yeah, Tiger hasn't done it, so why can't why can't the new boys club do it? So yeah, that was my, that was my number one. I thought that was pretty, yeah, yeah. pretty obvious. I'll give my like my second one um, is just Justin Thomas and Zach Johnson. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, JT actually, you know, he played well at the Fortnite. Uh, he actually, I think he was like two or three shots back going to the final round and kind of didn't really do much. However, I think it's kind of better he didn't actually win the tournament because then all eyes would even be more on him. So his match play record at, at the Rack Cup is six two and one. I think it's, I think he's like sixteen five and one. Uh, in like if you count Presidents Cup, so his record speaks for himself. We know the pressure that he has with his form and the decision that Captain Zach Johnson made. So I think those were kind of the you know the the drought and JT. I thought were kind of two no brainers for for mm -hmm. the storylines. Um, so those are kind of my top two. Um, my next three are kind of like out, of, not out of like the box, but for me, um, I guess you want to give another one of yours? Or yeah. So my, my second one, um, I actually, it's, uh, what's the fan influence going to be on this event? So it's Italy's first ever Ryder cup. It seems like on the surface, this is something that, many american fans would travel for as i am you know italy is a very popular travel destination for uh americans so i'm really curious to see how influential the crowd will be in this whether obviously it's gonna be pro-european that's a given but i'm kind of wondering if it will be there might be some decent sized pockets of american fans here um so yeah i i, I act that's my number two i actually think that's gonna be very interesting and important to see because that kind of builds off the the first storyline of the U.S. stinks playing abroad. Maybe this is their their shot, where it could be a little bit less yeah. of a solely European dominated crowd. Um, yeah, that's a good one. That's a... I'll run. I'll run into my third. I'll just keep going yeah. real quick. I'll just say my third, then pass it to you. Um, the third one will be obviously we talked about earlier. Team Europe sending a message. Playing in the BMW uh, PGA thingy or thingy, PGA Championship, um, should the U.S. have done something similar? Should they have all played in California? Should they have all played at the BMW? It, I only we can only talk about that depending on the results of the Ryder Cup next week. But I guess kind of like a storyline question would be: Should the U.S. have done more than just a scouting trip that only? You know, still three members of the team didn't go on. I think that's a very interesting storyline to, to potentially discuss if the U.S. ends up losing this. Do do the P, do the do all those guys always play this tournament, or did they all just like purposely play because like the Ryder Cup? Like, I'm I'm like 
moderately confident they played it because of the Ryder Cup. I have no idea, but it makes sense. I don't think maybe they do, but well, it's it's I, in England, so it would make sense that you know Fitzpatrick, Fleetwood, and Patton always play. So like Rom, Hovland, McElroy. Maybe, maybe I could be totally wrong, but well, Shane Lowry won I mean, last year. I know that. Yeah. So maybe like the maybe like the top guys played. I'm trying to look at the leaderboard last year. Um, but we'll get into that later. Um, my my third is I don't think hasn't really been talked about, but I think that the pressure of Rory. I think everyone talks about the JT pressure. I think that Rory has as much pressure. Um, we saw him cry at the Ryder Cup in a, you know, on course interview, uh, you know, how much this means to him, you know, on and off the course and this event. Um, we saw him, you know, throw a shoe to Ethan at the Ryder Cup last year or two years ago. So clearly, you know, was in some frustration and had to give it out on Ethan chucking up, mm-hmm. shoe to him, but, how dare he? um, I'm just thinking, like, for Rory, like, you have 30 years, and, like, if you lose this Ryder Cup, you know, I think that, on the, not his legacy will be tarnished, but I think for him, it'll kind of have, a, like, a little stink in his golf career that, you know, damn, like, I was on that team that, you know, JT and Spieth and, you know, Cantlay and Xander, like, you know, they came over and beat us. So I think that. I don't think Amos talking about this, but I think Rory probably himself thinks that he's, pre- you know, has pressure. He's obviously the most, you know, he's a captain of this team. He has the best match play record. He's like 12, 12 and three, I think. So I think for him, I think there's a lot of pressure on him to perform because they're like, they're top heavy. Like if, if Rory doesn't mm-hmm. come out and play well, they're done. Like I, yeah. I, I, you know, and I think there's, I think there's two players on our side that, um, if they don't play well, that we're also done too. So I think he's kind of one of those, like, you know, those swing players that, you know, he may have to play like five matches. So that is my third one. Um, I'll give him, I'll give you my fourth. I'm going to say, um, going back to the players, I think is like how to like the European players, rookies, and just the guys that didn't play well at Whistling Straits, how they bounce back. So, you know, you have the, Fleetwood, Rose, Lowry, and I'm specifically saying Hovland and Fitzpatrick. Hovland went 0 3 and 2 at Whistling Straits, and Fitzpatrick's 0 and 5. So you have two of their top five players. You can argue if Fitzpatrick's a top five player, maybe him or Fleetwood, mm-hmm. but you know these are two of their future, you know, captains of like the team, not you know actually captaining a team anytime soon. So. Again, I think those two have um, immense pressure on themselves to get that first point. Uh, maybe if they've gotten a point before, they wouldn't have as much pressure. But I think for those two, they need to show up too. Um, because as I, I, as I have said, like you have Hoygaard, Straka, Bobby Mack, Aberg, who haven't been in a Ryder Cup or you know probably didn't think that they would be on this team. So mm-hmm. I think it's important for those two kind of superstars in our in you know our sport who to try to bounce back from 2021, which I think they're, as we, I, you know, they both are definitely better players than they are now, or they were. So I think that's very interesting um, kind of storyline. Yeah, that's that's a good one. I'll, I'll hop into the fourth really quickly, kind of boring, but JT's influence on the team, um, I don't I don't think it's as high as the second, but, you know, it's it'll be a constant theme um, of how he performs, how if the U.S. loses, how people will scream he messed up the chemistry because he wasn't playing, oh, da 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 So quick quick and easy, uh, the fourth storyline would be JT's influence on the team, and I'll just read off the fifth as well. A um, little, little bit of an interesting one here. I, I think the answer is pretty simple why a lot of people didn't do it, but obviously the news broke a couple days ago that Sergio Garcia offered to pay, what was the total amount? $867,000 in Ryder Cup fines or uh, fines to the European Tour to play in the Ryder Cup. Now, obviously, that wasn't solely for this event. That probably would have helped him to play in European Tour or DP World Tour events in the future. But uh, I guess the storyline or, like, the question posed around that would be, why didn't we see other live golfers potentially pursue this? You know, money is kind of immaterial to them at this point with all their signing bonuses and whatnot. So 
I'm a little bit surprised that, listen, 867000 is not, like, it's a lot of money, don't get me wrong, but to them, it's like you know, nothing. So I'm a little bit surprised that we didn't see, you know, is that, uh, Dustin Johnson or uh, Ian Poulter or Lee Westwood or someone who, like, has been a perennial Ryder Cup player potentially explore this idea. So I think that's an interesting storyline that could be talked about in the future. Yeah, that's a good one. But, like, who – I know you mentioned, like, Westwood and Poulter. Like, I don't know who else on the live side for the Europeans because America, America, they don't have to pay fines because they're a part of the yeah. of America. So, like, Dustin, like, doesn't have to Yeah, pay no, you're right. You're or, right. Or, Phil, or Bryson. But, like, who else on the – who else from Live Golf who – would actually want to pay that fine of let's say a million dollars at this point to potentially be on the team when like Lee Westwood's time is done, you know, Paul Casey's time is done. I think Poulter's time is done. Um, so I think Sergio's is done as well. That's the only thing like they're I, all done. And I call, I, I'm going to call Sergio's bluff on that. No, it, it makes sense. It makes I sense. Think he's like, just, I think he's just saying that just to, like, like, what, you're going to do that like a week before? Like, I don't know when this, like, I don't know when he actually per- tried to pursue this. But, like, I think I think that's total cap. I think, like, mm-hmm. like, like what, you're paying, um, like, a million dollars? He would have done that months ago if he actually wanted to. Maybe he did, and they kind of, like, you know, said no, and then he's, like, coming out and saying that, like, I would do this. So, I mean, he knew his penalty. So, you know, you know, have fun in, like, your little couch, you know. <sighs> Sergio, you know, no one, no one cares about you. Um, my fifth storyline, which I think is um, maybe a little bit out of the box to be on top five, but I thought you probably wouldn't have this one, so it's something to talk about. Is I think the pairings for each side. I think we, you know, we talk about the U.S. pairings a bunch because we cheer for them, but what are like the Europeans going to do? Like you have. Your top, I'm going to say top five of Rory, Rom, Hovland, Fleetwood, um, you know, it's Patrick. You know, I guess mm-hmm. it's like, what do you, at least like the top four, you know, Fleetwood's playing in sing off, I think, and he's in my power rankings pretty high up there. So I'm just like, how do you, how do you kind of divide the talent up with the guys who haven't played or like, a veteran like Justin Rose, like how do you do that? Um, I think we have more natural pairings on our side. Um, obviously, the two are Cantlay and Xander and Spieth and JT. So I think honestly, like there's less pressure of Zach Johnson to make pairings. It's more the pressure to do these guys show up. Like, you know, I don't blame them if if JT, if, if like Xander and Cantlay play bad, you're not going to be like, well, the pairing was bad. You know, I guess like they brought in Burns to play with Scheffler, so I guess there's pressure on that pairing to succeed because like you pick Burns but you know I think there's less pressure on Zach Johnson with the pairings than Luke Donald like do you pair like Rory and Hovland you know the DP World Tour is pushing that whole like narrative that Rory and Hovland are like these like close friends and stuff and they put you know Aberg in that group and in the first and second round so I think that what Luke Donald does is really interesting that Rory and Lowry played together at Whistling Straits and that did not work out but that didn't mm-hmm. work out for probably for just because we were unstoppable. So, um, so I think that will be interesting with the pressure of Luke Donald with the pairings. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting one to, to yeah to to kind of see. There's gonna be some obscure pairings out there. I know we'll talk about that in the next episode. But there'll, there'll be some some matchups that just are thrown together just because like there's there's no. There's not as like on the U.S. There are seemingly more uh, clear cut and dry pairings that they that they would make. Um, the rider or the the Europeans kind of seem a little bit more. I don't want to say unique, but unknown. I guess is the best word. Um, yeah, I mean, I had an honorary storyline, which is is my hat theory going to be right? Oh gosh, <laughs> storyline that people will probably want to know. Um, I think uh-huh. it will be right. Um, however, you kind of want to say if it's right or not. So I think yeah. that's something that, you know, people are going to have to probably talk about and could be a, you know, question that you ask Zach Johnson and in the, you know, press conference. So if you can get yeah. you know, inside like the ropes, I'd, you know, ask if 
Josh, you know, Siegel's hat theory is uh, actually correct. Yeah, you got it. I'll uh, I'll make a few calls and I'll make it happen. That can be done pretty easily. Uh, but if if it is correct, uh, you should purchase said hats, the white and the blue. So I expect that that they should be delivered soon. Um, my final question to you. It's kind of a preview. So our next podcast for next week is we're gonna. It's gonna be more more fun. We'll do like you know sleepers, bull predictions, like our you know who's at the, the top. Our prediction for a top score of each side, you know, you know, top score for a rookie and stuff, and you know, we'll go through. But I think it'll be fun if we, one of us, you know, is Captain Luke Donald, one of us is Captain Zach Johnson, and we kind of lay out the pairings for. It's gonna be four ball in the morning, it's historically the, the Europeans pick. So we can either, you know, we can do that slate and maybe four sums in like the afternoon or just do one. But I think it would be fun if we kind of, you know, show up blindly again and um, throw out some pairings. Um, so my question is, do you want to be Luke Donald or Zach Johnson? I would like to be uh, Zach Johnson because I'm going to take that title away from you right now. Nice. I wanted to be Luke Donald. So then if, if we're doing that, are we going to honor, are we going to do – um, the a la four played and uh, po- I'll, I'll uh, we'll podcast in from the first tee box the day before. Uh, uh, so on Thursday, because I have a ticket on Thursday. So we might have to make a podcast happen from the from the grandstand of the first tee box. That'd be funny. If you want to do that, we can make it happen. Uh, you know, I'll be I'll be around at whatever point i guess it'll actually it's a more of an advantage for me because of the time difference but um yeah if you want to make that happen i also have dan robert port's contact information so if, if, if you want to do a duo podcast it's nice can, and easy uh, i could dm him um fellow friend of the program so yeah yeah but, make it simple right, well captain zach johnson i'll be luke donald um which is good i'll have fun with it there's more creativity on my side than your side. So I'm happy that you did yeah. Zach Johnson. Um, Fair enough. So I'll yeah, be we'll lay out the four four ball in the morning and then we'll have fun with the four sims in the afternoon. Then we'll go through bowl predictions and different fun, maybe bets that we can do together. And, um, you know, Ethan can maybe influence them as being on site. So those are my final yeah. thoughts. Anything else? No, that that about sums it up. So thank you for listening. Um, looking forward to a lot of great content out here. Again, we're very lucky to have uh, the on-site reporter again, which I guess would be me this week since you're coming off of the Tour Championship. So looking forward to another another great batch of content coming that way. But thank you to our listeners out there, and we will see you guys next week.